Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Wherever you are in the world, whether in beautiful paradise, Hawaii, or somewhere on the mainland or across the world, you know that the economy is always top of mind. We live in an economic world. Money, scarcity, all of these things are realities with which we deal, and we moderate an economic life. Well, how should we think about economics. Uh, very often here in the state of Hawaii and throughout the country, economic issues are seen disconnected from one another. We have a problem such as individuals who can't afford housing or who live on the streets, and so we set about trying to solve that particular problem. Or the price of electricity is high, so we try to solve that problem. Rarely do we sit down and look at the entire economic system, nor do we ask the question, how should we think economically? That's why I am so delighted today to have a dear friend of many, many years who truly understands what economics is all about. He's a professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University, and he's a scholar in economics at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. We benefit much from his scholarship, and more than that, from his wisdom as he takes a look at contemporary problems and gives an educator's point of view. Please welcome to the program today, Ken Scullin. Ken, aloha. Good to have you back <laughs> aloha, on the program. Kenny. Well, you and I have been talking for years and years about the economy. Have we fixed it yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we haven't uh, had their ear yet. <laughs> you know, you actually were what we'd call a working economist at, at one point. You, you worked for a government organization, uh, and yet you've moved into the role of educator for the past mm -hmm. couple of decades at least. Yeah, well, tell me you. about that. Yeah. What, what, what calls you to the profession of professorship? Well, I... Uh, Thank you very much. I, I started off as an international economist in the International Trade Commission. At that time, it was called the Tariff Commission, then the Commerce Department, and then the Office of Special Representative for Trade Negotiations uh, in the White House. So uh, you've had a lot of nuts and bolts experience in economic policy as it's being applied in the world. Yes, and, and like uh, making sausage, I saw how unsavory <laughs> it was uh, in, in the production of policy and, and how much as a bureaucrat, I got in the way of people, and that's when I decided to leave Washington, D.C. and go up to Alaska first to, to teach uh, economics and then come to here to Hawaii. You said getting in the way of people. That, that must have been a little confounding to be in a profession that you love because you want to help people yeah. and you want to help the world, but you find the governmental administration of economic matters to be something that gets in the way of people. What do you mean? That's right. I felt that uh, so much of what uh, bureaucrats were doing it was rather pompous, uh, trying to control people and intervene in their lives. When I realized they, they knew better what they were doing than, than I did as, a, as a, an official in Washington. And then the kinds of surveys and interventions that I would do just were a huge burden on their, on their time and energy and, and uh, often giving favors to some at the expense of others. And um, it, it was counterproductive. If I wanted to really help people produce, the best thing I thought was to leave them alone. And that was essentially the uh, philosophy of, um, of the early um, uh, laissez-faire economists. Uh, the best thing to do is to leave them alone, and they can find their own ways without uh, the guidance of government officials and politicians. Well, there's a certain philosophy that you have been espousing, and, and I'd hate to use labels. You know, you know better than I do those pedagogical charts that have all of the names of schools of economics. <laughs> and it can be really baffling to the non-economist. Actually, it's baffling to economists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have Keynesian, we have monetarists, we have the term free market. But I think that there are some basic principles that you go back to that would be incumbent upon anyone who does good economic thinking. Well, give me one of those principles. Well, I think that uh, basically we, we, we shouldn't be advising officials in government or people in general society to be doing things that we wouldn't do personally. If it's not right for me to steal from you or to control your life and to shoot you or things like that, I shouldn't be asking government officials to do it on my behalf. And, and I think that ethical behavior starts by applying generally to, to government, what we find is, is reasonable and ethical between ourselves. Well, you know, that's quite fascinating, Ken, because uh, I would have expected from an economist an answer that had something to do with dollars and cents, <laughs> <laughs> that had to do with scarce resources and their distribution to competing ends. But you start to talk like me, like a philosopher. <laughs> uh, you, you talk about ethics. Uh, wh where do these ethics come from? I, I, I hear... 
I hear strains of Confucius in, 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 in what you have to say, who said, do not do unto other people what you would not have them do unto you. There, there, there seems to be something rather traditional in this philosophy of reciprocity. Well, I think most societies have uh, uh, moral advocates who are advocating a kind of, of, uh, a kind of good society that we would all want to agree with. It's just that uh, as soon as we get into the practice of actual life, we all so often rationalize uh, immoral behavior because it gets us what we want to have as a, as a shortcut. And so people often uh, say, well, it's not right for me to steal from you, but if I can just rationalize the government stealing from you so that I can have what I want, then, then it's okay. And I, I, amazingly, I find uh, in my surveys of students, would they take a, a bribe? If they were a politician, would they take a bribe to use the power of government to steal from some, to give, give to others? In um, order to accomplish ends that they consider to be good. Well, what no, you, what, even, or even bad just ends. Just to raise the price of bread. You know, would you be willing to take mm -hmm. a bribe to, to, to raise the price of bread for everyone in the country, one penny a loaf, but would you take a bribe of a uh, million dollars? And even though everyone says that should be illegal for others to do, almost everyone in my survey say they would do it themselves if the money was enough you know and then they rationalize it well it's only a penny per loaf of bread uh, uh, if i don't do it somebody else will do it or uh, yeah it's wrong but a million dollars is really nice i i mean they can always or i'll use the million dollars for good causes you know people will always rationalize good uh, uh, outcomes for it but in fact the the, the means uh, of accomplishing this is something that they would never want other people to do and they want it illegal for other people to take bribes but if they themselves have the opportunity uh, they do it. Well isn't that fascinating? Uh, willingness to be pragmatic, willingness to be rather relativist in terms of values mm -hmm. with no absolutes but at the same time as you point out the ability to look at others and say that's wrong I don't want that to to be done do you think that that may be the anchor we have in our society for some kind of moral sense uh, yeah I find that when people um, actually there are some who stick to principle and moral ethics regardless of the payoff in other words we have a million dollars absolutely secret uh, no legal penalty, still they won't take the million dollars to do something that's wrong. And I ask them, well, why? And they say, well, because it's, it's wrong. And those people serve as an encouragement for other people to guide, to, to, to look at ethical principles. And that's why some countries are a lot better at uh, reducing corruption than others. You know, because in many countries, there are, there are very few people who, who are willing to, to say no to uh, temptations like that. But we're fortunate that we do have a few people who set the, the principle, the guideline, and, and a lot of people um, follow along with it. Well, I, I distinctly remem remember my first day in class as an undergraduate at Northwestern University studying economics, Robert Eisner's macroeconomics course in mm -hmm. Keynesian economics. Mm -hmm. Lesson number one, supply and demand. Yeah. Learning yeah. that point at which the supply curve intersects a demand curve equilibrium. We didn't start off with ethics, <laughs> but, but you, you teach your students from ethics. You've written a textbook for economics mm -hmm. called The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, and it begins with an ethical principle that you own your life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that. Well, every chapter in that book, it's 40, mm -hmm. 40 pages. Uh, now I'm pleased to say it's in 80, published in 83 editions in 53 languages around wow, the world. Wow, so that. it's been doing It's available well. all over the world. Yeah, yeah. It's used in school systems all over the world. That's right. You know, at the university level and at uh, elementary school level. Is it level. used in the Hawaii school system? Uh, not yet, actually. <laughs> that was offered. Sam Sloan offered free copies for the, for the Department of Education, and, and uh, they, they kept uh, putting it off and putting it off. Uh, I think we're convinced that probably it'll be accepted in North Korea before it gets accepted <laughs> in the public schools here. Well, and so <laughs> that very first principle is you own yourself. Why is that an important ethical value for any economic system? Uh, because, uh, what does that mean, by the way? Because de to deny that is to presume mm -hmm. that somebody else owns your life and can control your life, your liberty, and your property. And this is a very s fundamental principle of this country. You but know, don't we let a, a very big brother control our life, our liberty, <laughs> and our property? All too often. But we, we remember that our, our Declaration of Independence started off, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's obvious to everyone that uh, all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their, by their creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Those were the fundamental principles of the country. But then very soon they got away from that and, and of course rationalized all forms of, of controls by government of everything. When, they, when it should have been just protecting people's uh, life, liberty and property, instead it came to be controlling every aspect of people's life, liberty and property with the Keynesian philosophy, the uh, socialist philosophy, many philosophies uh, that rationalize it for a, a, you know, a greater good than, than you having your own, your own life and decisions. But how do we organize ourselves economically? Uh, we need roads. We need uh, fixed rail systems. <laughs> we, we need, we, we, we need uh, works, public works. We need welfare systems. We need a medical insurance system and all of that. I mean, how do we get these goods without the government taking from us our hard-earned goods and money in the form of taxes. How, how does this take place? I mean, isn't this part and parcel of the way the economy works? I think to many people, there's no alternative. I know, because that's what they've been taught in the government schools for throughout the, almost all of their well, lives. Well, and even our teachers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, every year, uh, for the past several years, there's been a big bill that has come to the Hawaii legislature sponsored by the teachers union that says we need more of this, more of that, and more of this in order to help our kids, because mm -hmm. education is number one. So let's increase the taxes on everybody. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be formulaic that uh, the way we get the economy running the way it should run is we take from people and use that to produce the economic goods we want. There's your that, thoughts that on fundamental that? point of do you own your life or does the government own your mm -hmm. life? And actually that was a sort of a, a beginning point when I um, first asked my mom as a kid, you know, what, what's the difference between one party and the other? And, and at one point she said, well, this political party wants you to control your own life and this party wants you, the government, to control life for you. I came to believe that both the major political parties were both uh, doing the same thing later on, that they were both trying to control my life. Um, but I think that uh, people in this country have become great and, and successful and prosperous because of the degree that people have been allowed the freedom to pursue their own interests uh, without the controls of government. And that's throughout the world. If you look at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, countries that have the greatest degrees of, of freedom uh, in economic freedom, not necessarily political freedom, but in economic freedom, uh, they have the greatest prosperity and the greatest uh, civil liberties, the greatest opportunities for political uh, expression, the greatest environmental results, the lowest corruption. All of those things come along with the higher degrees of economic freedom. Uh, because freedom produces so much more wealth and prosperity than controls and governmental uh, dictates. Now this is not just <clears throat> a philosophy, the, the economic freedom of the world and its companion, the economic freedom of North America, use rigorous empirical data looking at every economy on the planet and uh, identifying through very clear markers where freedom, the kind of freedom you're talking about, where, where the government minimally takes from you your life, liberty, and your, your pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. where that is high and takes a look at the outcomes in society, and where that is low looks at those outcomes, and we see where there's great freedom, there's actually greater prosperity and fewer social ills, and where there's a lack of that freedom, we have more social ills. So do you think that the government itself, the the strong kind of government we have here in the United States, which compels a great deal of our income through taxes, is actually responsible for many of the economic ills? Yes, most definitely. Uh, in what way? Uh, well, I, I, I'd say the, the, the very slow growth, uh, the high taxes. I, I take here in particular in, in Hawaii. You mentioned at the outset about uh, the issues of homeless in Hawaii. Well, I'd say that uh, that the, the government has prohibited some of the lowest cost uh, kinds of housing that could be available, has been available across the mainland, is illegal here, mobile homes. They're very low cost, could easily be brought in, and, but the barriers, the prohibitions against these things make it uh, uh, so that it's not available. The land control, only 5% of the land area of the island of, of, of the Hawaiian Islands are zoned for all commercial and residential use. And this tremendous constriction on the use of land has tremendously raised the cost of land. If they loosened up on the uh, usability, allowing people more freedom in how they are going to utilize the lands, uh, how they w are able to provide housing, even such things as uh, bring in shipping without the Jones Act controlling uh, the, the importation and the exportation of products uh, from Hawaii to the mainland, 
Uh, these things could tremendously lower the costs of, uh, of all of these things in Hawaii. Well, it sounds like you're giving us a freshman lesson in supply and demand. <laughs> <laughs> if the government is able to keep the supply low and the demand continues to grow, the price of the product increases incredibly. We see this in land That's use, right. we see this in shipped goods and so forth. When we come back from break, tell us more, please, yeah, good. especially about how we can find some solutions through what you call free market economics. Mm -hmm. My guest is Ken Scullin, a professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University and uh, a Grassroot Institute scholar. Uh, don't go away because in a minute we'll be right back and we'll talk about some of the principles for building a solid economic understanding. I'm Kili'i Akina, Grassroot Institute. We're watching a Hanakako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Welcome back from our break. This is Ehana Kako here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, where we like to say Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. Let's work together for a better economy, government, and society. And our hats tip to the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, Jay Fidel, and wonderful staff and team who produce about 35 hours of high quality content every week broadcast from downtown Honolulu. Now my guest today, Ken Scullin, understands what economics is all about. He's been a working economist, but more than that, he's been an educator of young minds that have gone on and now are somewhat older minds, uh, people who are filled with ideas as to how to bring about solutions to economic problems. And we're going to talk a little bit about that now as we explore a bit about free market economics. So my guest again, Ken Scullin. Mm -hmm. Ken, you know, that term free market economics mm -hmm. is uh, often misunderstood. Mm -hmm. What would you consider a good definition of uh, free market economics? Uh, simply uh, allowing the innovative entrepreneurial talents of human beings in society to come up with solutions, and they do remarkably. You remember some years ago before we had these things, when there was a single long line of a telephone into your house that was the only communication you had for for everything and I, I remember uh, I was making a call up to Alaska in the early 1980s before they broke up uh, AT&T and it cost ten dollars a minute for me to make a phone call to a friend up there but then when they broke up AT&T and they said well, we're going to have competition and allow people in the innovative spirit of the of the of the world to to bring about better communication <laughs> They came up with not to just better communication, where you can call anywhere in the planet vir virtually for free, even with a, a face in, in mind, but with all of the other thousands of apps that allow us to do so many other things. That's the, the, the inventive and com creative spirit of the market that we don't have under the, the lack of vision through governmental um, controls and monopolies that are handed out to this favored group or that favored group. So the f a free spirit really is at the heart of free market economics, the creation of wonderful ideas that meet the needs of humanity. So there is a product, there is a demand for that product, and when the demand for the product meets the product itself, we have a free market. Yeah, sure. Except sure. where government comes in the middle and intervenes for yeah. what kinds of ways does the government intervene th th that are not productive one way that's been very harmful to Hawaii over the years beginning in May of 1940 uh, the Public Utilities Commission outlawed all competition with the bus you know right. we had many competitors providing uh, better service lower cost friendly 
the Rosecrans Bus Company and some seven Jitney companies were providing tremendous tra transportation for people around the island of Oahu. And the Public Utilities Commission was trying to give a favor to the one largest bus company and saying, well, we're going to issue a cease and desist order against all the competition. The public had come out largely in favor, wildly in favor of all the competition. Leave the competition. They're great. It's better service, lower prices. But no, they put them all out of business. And since then, we've had declining uh, service. We've had uh, now heavily subsidized monopoly service uh, for over 60 years, 66 uh, years, and w uh, actually 76 years. And uh, because of this very, very poor service of transportation, now they said, well, we're going to solve that with a $10 billion 20 mile, uh, 20 mile railroad that's twice the cost of the, of the second Panama Canal Zone. And um, we could uh, we simply make that unnecessary by allowing competition with the bus, allow people through all of their innovation now to you compete. Now, you see government as playing favors to different parties. So minimizing the level of competition. Well, what are the virtues of competition when, when it's allowed to w serve the economy? The best thing is innovation. Then second, you get better service and you get lower prices as a part of, as a component of that. All of those things happen as what uh, is essentially factor X. Um, that's the enormous inventive spirit of the human beings when they are allowed to compete with each other. Tremendous things that uh, you'll notice just disappear in, under government monopoly. Now, some people may argue that competition is fine and well when you live in a big place like the mainland of the United States. But when you're in an island in the middle of the Pacific, surrounded by water, competition it, it, it doesn't work out so well because our resources are so scarce, our people are so few. And besides that, we like each other and don't want to compete <laughs> with one another. Have you heard any of this before, Ken? Well, good, yeah, good service is the best way to make uh, good friends and relations with uh, lots and lots of people. It's when you can't compete that you get uh, people angry, angrily fighting over power in the, in the legislature because they, they're, they're upset with what they're, what they're given through electricity or through land or through uh, shipping and transportation. But look at Hong Kong. It's a small, a small place and, um, you know, confined. It's, uh, and yet it's the fastest growing economy in the industrial world, now richer than most all of the countries of Europe. Just 50 years ago or about 60 years ago, it was one of the poorest countries on the planet. And yet they were the most free market. They allowed people to come there from all over the planet. They were allowed to start businesses and innovate. And they produced an enormous amount of prosperity so that they weren't expecting their children to grow up in the poorest country in the world. Now they have the opportunity to offer their children and grandchildren the richest country, the greatest prosperity. And that happened because they were simply allowed far more economic freedom than, than almost any other places on the planet. Now, you mentioned earlier the Economic Freedom of the World Report, which is produced by Fraser Institute That's right, in, in Canada. Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, according to that report, as well as a companion report produced by the Heritage uh, Foundation, Hong Kong ranks always one or two, year after year, in economic freedom. That's in, right. In terms of the minimal amount of invasive participation by the government. And they've even fended off a good deal of that from the communist government since the mm -hmm. return. What's the relationship between that and the, the growth of the GDP of Hong Kong, the rise of the quality of life for people, the high levels of employment, and the opportunities for c capital investment and entrepreneurship? Well, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore have always ranked at the top. So it's not a measure of political freedom, because Hong Kong's never really had political freedom. Right. It's and economic in freedom. Singapore, you, you, you can't spit on the sidewalk freely. And a lot more civil freely. liberties uh, occur <laughs> when, you, when you've got uh, the economic freedom. You become more prosperous, and you can move around the planet as you choose. Um, but the third on that, on that list is New Zealand. Now, I consider that a, a stellar example of before and after governmental controls uh, were lifted. Um, New Zealand, after World War II, was the slowest growing economy of the industrial world with high, extremely high uh, controls of the, through taxes and trade barriers and regulations and uh, various uh, state-operated enterprises. But in 1984, under the Labour Party, the Socialists of New Zealand, 
they undertook the most radical free market reforms of the 20th century. And they, uh, they ended the trade barriers, they cut taxes in half, they sold off most of their state-operated enterprises, they, um, they uh, tremendously deregulated their economy, and it became the fastest growing economy in the industrial world, providing uh, astounding uh, uh, prosperity. One example was the, the farmers. They were the most heavily subsidized farmers in the world, heavily subsidized by borrowing from all around the world. But finally, when they ran out of credit, they, they had to cut off the subsidies. And they ended the subsidies in three months. And the farmers then became the strongest advocates of getting rid of everybody else's subsidies, saying, if we can do without it, so can you. And before long, they, there were, farmers were earning five times as much income on less land than ever before, because they were farming smart instead of just farming to what the government was sure. uh, subsidizing. Well, what lessons would you give, and we'll close with this, to our state legislators if they appointed you to a position that, such as economist to the legislature? What are some things you might say? Well, I, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I, I think the biggest battles would be just uh, persuading the, the, Cong the legislators of, of what, ne what needs to be done. I, I'd much rather persuade the population, because the politicians will follow the, popul the, the popular will uh, later, but as long as the popular will is to give up so much control and power to the legislatures, they'll just gobble up all that power. You mentioned so, earlier your book, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, A Free Market Odyssey, and you and I have had many conversations over chapters in that book. Mm -hmm. Tell everyone where they can get a hold of that book. Um, you can get a copy on Amazon, or you can contact me at uh, Hawaii Pacific University. Uh, the bookstore has copies at uh, HPU. Um, but it's available in 53 languages all around the world. Uh, uh, you can, uh, just uh, last month I received the, the Malaysian edition which just came out and we'll have new editions in Berber, Arabic, uh, French, uh, Thai, uh, Khmer, uh, Burmese, uh, coming up in, the, in Punjabi. Well, wonderful. Uh, in, the, in the next, and we've had it uh, produced as a play in, uh, across Africa and in Eastern Europe and a musical production in Kazakhstan. That sounds good. Well, Ken, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, it. Kelly. I appreciate being my, here. My guest today, Ken Scullin, professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University and Grassroot Institute scholar. We'll be back next week on ThinkTech Hawaii's Ehana Kako and Kili'i Akina signing off and saying aloha.